Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long ways from home, a long ways from home. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Way up in the heavenly land. Way up in the heavenly land mm -hmm. a long ways from home a long ways from At the bottom of the heart of every human being, from earliest infancy until the tomb, there is something that goes on indomitably expecting. In the teeth of all experience of crimes committed, suffered, and witness, that good and not evil will be done to him. It is this, above all, that is sacred in every human being. This profound and childlike and unchanging expectation of good in the heart is not what is involved when we agitate for our rights. The motive which prompts a little boy to watch jealously, to see if his brother has a slightly larger piece of cake arises from a much more superficial level of the soul. The word justice means two very different things according to whether it refers to the one or the other level. It is only the former one that matters. Thank you. 
Dearest brothers and sisters, may God give you peace. I am Father Ibrahim al sabbar a Franciscan friar who was sent in 2014 to Aleppo in the middle of the disorder of the war, as a head of the Latin community of the city and as an Episcopal vicar. At the first glance, based on international news reports, it may appear that the situation in Syria is getting better. In reality, the situation is still very critical. Three neighborhoods in Aleppo are still getting bombarded and daily we hear about many casualties, both dead and wounded because the ongoing battle. This painful reality means our unemployment rate is over 70% and our poverty rate over 80%. Many of our families are barely able to afford their daily bread. And for the ethnic and religious minorities, including Christians, things are even harder. When my superior asked me if I was ready to go and serve in Aleppo, I could not imagine what could be waiting for me. I am a Syrian born in Damascus, but I knew nothing about Aleppo. Until 2014, I served throughout the Middle East, but never in Syria. For me, Aleppo was what I heard from the news. I was able to simply, simply refuse to go. Because of the danger of death, death, nobody could force me to go or blame me if I didn't. What drove me to accept without hesitation was what my superior said. Aleppo is in need. People are in need. I went to Aleppo with faith. I was certain that God's grace would give me something to start from. I went to Aleppo carrying with me only my trust and surrender to God. I went carrying my limited love toward Him and toward His people and with my thirst to serve Him through every person in need. In fact, I am certain that charity is something that springs from an open heart, which leads one to make things he or she has never conceived of. This is how all the miracles I have witnesses, witnessed in my four years in Aleppo have come about. For example, on Sunday, October 2015, at 6 p.m., I was celebrating Mass when a missile hit the cupola of our church. It could have been a massacre, but miraculously nobody died or was seriously hurt. But the greater miracle happened the same day and the day after, when many parishioners, defeating fear, came to clean and start repairing the church. And an even greater miracle happened the following Sunday, when people more numerous than usual came for Mass and the shell of the missile was used as a vase of flowers to be offered in prayer for whomever launched the missile. Another miracle is about Rula. Rula currently leads the catechism in our parish and various other humanitarian projects of the Latin Church in Aleppo. She studied and graduated in France as a biologist. Then she got married in 1995 to Tony, a well-known lawyer in Aleppo. In 2000, Edma, their only daughter, was born. When this, the war started in 2012 and Aleppo became a battlefield between the rebel and the regular army, she and her family decided to remain instead of moving to France. In 2014, the war became more violent, and while Rula's mother and brothers left Aleppo, she and Tony renewed their decision to remain. And here her clavery, made of hungry, thirst, cold, and instability began. The condo where they were living was basically 
in the crossfire of the two armies, and often bullets were hitting the building. On day in 2015, after she crossed a street from her house, a missile hit the building, destroying it and killing 11 people. She understood that she was alive because of a miracle and moved with her family to her parents' house in a quieter neighborhood of Aleppo called Villad. However, in 2016, Villad also started to be bombed and missiles hit houses very close to theirs. One of their friends died. So for the second time, frightened and full of sorrow, they moved to a house close to my parish, St. Francis. Ten months later, one morning, a missile hit very close to St. Francis, exactly when her husband and daughter were supposed to arrive home. Terrified, Rula immediately called her daughter, Edma. At first, she didn't answer, and then started answering, but screaming. Rula ran desperately toward her house and saw the house almost destroyed, and Edma was there, pale and fearful, but alive. It was another miracle. While Edma was opening the door of her apartment, the missile hit the opposite side of the building and the door protected Edma from the flying debris. With no other places to go, in a town already destroyed by the war, they decided to remain. Thanks be to God, through the help of the Latin Church, her house was rebuilt very quickly. The Church cannot take away the cross, but at least can make it lighter. Rola, Tony and Edma still live there, where she can see every day the view of a destroyed city. Even in the midst of so much insecurity, bitterness and fear, with nightmares tormenting her at night, Rula understood through prayer that she was called to remain in Aleppo and to help the ever-growing number of undefended and terrified children whose families do not have the means to escape. And so little by little, more and more parents are sending their children to the catechism program she directs. 250 at first, then 450 children, and today 900 youth. So an oasis in the desert was born, where children are healed from every point of view. An oasis entrusted to the tender hands of a mother, expert in suffering. But Rula also works in the parish center, open every day for seven from seven in the morning until midnight to welcome whoever is in need. Sometimes as a nurse, sometimes as a firefighter, sometimes as a social worker, but always as a mother. Once a needy old man came to the parish and started to tell Rula about all of his sufferings. At the end he asked, but who are you? I feel you are my mother. A motherly love radiates from your face, from your words. At the end of her very long day at the parish, she is often exhausted and then she goes home and takes care of her husband and daughter. Sometimes she is so tired that she cannot even sleep, but as she says when asked, she is glad in her heart because she serves the Lord. When she is asked, why did you remain? She answers, because I have so many children in this city. I feel that the Lord wants me here. I have a mission right here in the midst of the ruins. And once someone asked, where does all this gratitudeness come from? And she answered, while people are prey to despair, I experience the gratitude of Christ who gave me my life. I cannot help but give it back with the gift of myself. She started as a housewife 
a woman hidden within the walls of her house, excellent at cooking and keeping her house tidy. By opening herself to the needs of the others, she has discovered at 45 years the many gifts of her life. Let me finish with a wish. May God bless this encounter of 2019. May all the participants go out after the end of this event of friendship enriched with something or someone to start from, to change all our world and all our reality. that bitterness may turn into gladness. This is the inspiration, the criterion for all we do. We choose a movie instead of another. We choose a companionship instead of another, and so on. We resign ourselves to study or to work, as long as at some point, bitterness be turned into gladness. This is right. In fact, this is what reveals the nature of man. As our father Dante used to say, at some point, Dante indeed says, each one confusedly a good conceives wherein the mind may rest and longeth for it. Everybody has a confused intuition of a good in which the mind may rest meaning a good in which the soul may reach complete satisfaction, corresponding to the word that can be pronounced with seriousness only religiously, the word happiness, and longeth, it longs. And this is the fundamental art of life. It is like the spark that ignites the engine for every action, and everybody strives, struggles for happiness. This is the nature of man according to the Christian tradition. Luigi Giussani. In August of 2017, a group of Ivy League professors published a letter addressed to incoming freshmen and to all students. And the content of this letter can be summed up in the phrase, think for yourself. They elaborated on this saying, question dominant ideas, even when your friends or your professors, anyone insist on their being treated as unquestionable. Be wary of conformism and groupthink. One of my friends found this letter and shared it with us, a group of university students across North America. When we read the letter, we felt immediately that it was something that touched a part of us and our university life that is really dear to us and that we all have questions about. In fact, we had many conversations about this letter, some that lasted over two hours because we clearly had a lot of things to say and a lot of questions for this prof these professors. So we synthesized our thoughts in a letter of our own and sent it to the professors at the end of this letter asking questions back to them and if they would like, asking if they would like to meet with us to continue speaking. In the letter, we explained how grateful we were to these professors for helping us recognize this mentality in the world, in the states, and especially on campuses, this group think or this, these ideas that can be treated as unquestionable. But we also said that we were really grateful that they helped us realize that this tyranny of public opinion, as they phrased it, operates within ourselves first and foremost. We realized that it can be extremely difficult to think for ourselves. It's easy to go with the flow, and we have a fear that others, our friends especially, will identify us with what we think and say, reducing us only to those opinions. 
And so we often stay quiet and keep our questions and thoughts to ourselves so as not to risk losing the respect of our friends. We also realize that in order to think for ourselves, we have to understand what this self is. And in fact, we talked a lot about the quote from Jasani that was just read, which is this idea of and definition by Leopardi about the heart, something that exists inside each of us, a general desire, need for truth, happiness, peace, justice. And in our many conversations, we said, if this is true, if I share with every single person on the street, if every student in my class has the same basic need that I have, then dialogue or asking these questions about university life or anything actually can become not just ideas bouncing around, but instead a journey taken in common to get to the heart of these questions to get the, to this true self that we all have. And often we realize, and I did in my, I have been in my experience, that it takes some, someone else, like a letter from professors, or a dialogue with a person who might hold extremely different opinions from me, to reawaken my sleepy heart, or this thing inside of me that is kind of sleeping, so that I can really start to ask the questions that matter in my life, why am I here, what am I doing, and how can I live? Well, I was in college, the questions of conformism and groupthink, or all these questions in general, were definitely on my mind. But by and large, for four whole years, I stayed silent. And I had this fear that my friends would put me in a box that I didn't think it all represented me. And often I felt suffocated and I didn't really know what to do with that, and I didn't know quite where to start. But then, a couple of my friends showed me this letter and asked me to think about it and take part in it. And we started talking together and meeting with these professors. And I think I actually didn't realize it was possible for me personally to start really living these questions and talking to professors in this way. And it's not that I'm not afraid anymore, um, but that I have people who are really helping me grow and live. And I wouldn't have done this if it weren't for these friends. I'll share with you a couple of things that the professors have said in our conversation. After meeting with one of them, uh, he sent us an email thanking us and saying, it is exceedingly rare that I have the chance to talk so openly about such fundamental and important questions. It is also genuinely encouraging to see that there are students out there who are so engaged by such questions that they will travel to speak with professors about them. You all made quite an impression on me. One of the most interesting things for me in the conversations with these professors is when one of them said that in his perception, the most difficult thing today is to see what's directly in front of our eyes. And he thought that, he thinks that, and he says that in universities today, there's kind of a, a somewhat unknown or perhaps hidden goal to convince students that what we see in front of our eyes isn't the case. It isn't real. And he added, we have no way to discuss what a human should be and how to live because we don't agree on any common foundation anymore. And the belief that many in our culture hold is that we are the sovereign of our life, we can decide exactly who we want to be and how, and we decide what reality is. And in meeting with these professors, my experience has been, I would say, a bit of the opposite in the sense that I need the professor who has the other, a different idea, I need someone to provoke me. And I can, only make, I can only make sense of myself in the context of a greater whole and in relation with others. And also the fact that I, I don't decide what this life or what this reality is, I don't create it or make it, but somehow 
It's something that comes to me and I can discover it or not. I can really see it or not. And one of the professors also said to me in conversation, if you've graduated from college without ever being offended, you should ask for your money back. <laughs> in the sense that we really should be challenged and we should be offended and we should have, education should be painful. And he said we need a master who can guide us. Teachers need to be masters in the sense of the term master's degree. And this is a bit what I've found in asking these questions helped by others who are farther along the path, that I need someone to follow, I need someone to guide me. And I cannot find my way without a road, but realizing that I also have this heart in the way that Jasani and Leopardi define it, to recognize the road that is in front of me. What makes a prisoner stay and work when he could try to escape? And what makes people like Father Ibrahim and Rula remain in Aleppo and keep building, risking their life when they could run? And what makes a young student like Miriam challenge the common mentality and start knocking at professors' doors? But also, you heard the spiritual that Shelton Beckton sang for us. Where does that cry come from? Where does that pain come from? What is it made of? Or the yearning of Ligeti's cello's piece that Marcel Krasner played for us? What is the thread that ties all these apparently teeny tiny dots so far apart from each other? There is something, and it is that something that we want to get to know during these days, keeping our eyes open, keeping our ears open, and keeping our hearts open. We worked all these months, a long journey that brought us here tonight, carrying with us Cesare Pavese's question. I don't know if you remember it. Has anyone ever promised us anything? Then why do we expect something? Has anyone ever promised anything to those prisoners in Brazil, to those people in Aleppo, to us here? Then why is that we're expecting something? Because we do expect something, and we do because we can't help it. Father Giussani, commenting on Pavese's question, wrote, perhaps he, Pavese, didn't realize that expectation is the very structure of our nature, is the essence of our soul. It is not something calculated, it is given. For the promise is at the origin, from the very origin of our creation. He who has made man has also made him a promise. Structurally, man waits. Structurally, he is a beggar. Structurally, life is promise. And that is why we're here, kicking off this 2019 New York encounter.